Hello, I'm Sula, host of Sula's Big Adventures, and this is Chapter 17, Part 3 of my complete video guide to becoming an amateur astronomer, Guide to the Constellations of Spring. In Part 1 of this chapter, I provided an overview of the constellations, and I discussed the constellations of autumn. And if you want to start there, here's the link. In Part 2, I covered the constellations of winter. Now I'm going to cover the constellations of spring. Ah, spring. In this video, I'll show you how to find the constellations of spring, and I'll tell you about the legends and myths associated with those constellations, and what notable objects you can see in each constellation, with your naked eye, with binoculars, or small telescope, and big telescope. The constellations I'll be covering in this chapter are Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Leo, Boötes, Canis Venatici, Coma Berenices, Corona Borealis, Hercules, Corvus, Hydra, and Virgo. So let's go outside and find the constellations of spring. It's a beautiful evening for stargazing and to look for some constellations. In spring, we can start by facing north and looking for one of the most familiar patterns in the sky, the Big Dipper. You'll probably recognize it. It looks like a bowl with a handle it's also known as the plow, and in spring, the bowl will be on top of the handle, or later in spring, it'll be pouring out its contents. Right now, it's, uh, the bowl is on top of the handle, and here it is. But it's not actually a constellation. An asterism is just a pattern of stars in the sky, whereas a constellation is an actually official designation by the IAU. The actual constellation is Ursa Major, the Big Bear. But most people recognize the asterism known as the Big Dipper as part of Ursa Major. So that's where we're going to start. So here's the bowl, and from the bowl of the Dipper, we can find other constellations. The two stars at the end of the bowl, Dubi and Mirac are known as the pointer stars, and they will point to Polaris, the North Star, and Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. And in between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper is Draco, the dragon, and you can follow his tail, and he runs in between them and down and curves underneath the Little Dipper to the head of the dragon here. And if you continue the line from the pointer stars in the Big Dipper through Polaris, the North Star, it will point to the top of the two-story house, Cepheus, the king. And here it is, it's kind of faint. And then going back to the Big Dipper, the two pointer stars point in the opposite direction to Regulus, the brightest star in the constellation Leo the Lion which contains the asterism, the sickle, or the backward question mark. And here it is. And going back to the Big Dipper, the last star in the handle of the Big Dipper is called Alcade, and it makes an arc, and it arcs to Arcturus, the brightest star in Bootes, the herdsman. And continuing in a line from Arcturus, will take you to Spica or Spica. It's the brightest star in Virgo, low on the horizon. So from the handle, Alcade, arc to Arcturus, and speed to Spica or Spica. Below Spica or Spica in Virgo, low on the horizon will be a misshapen square or trapezo trapezoid, Corvus, the crow. Going back to Alcade, the end of the handle of the Big Dipper, you'll find two small constellations, Canis Venatici, which is basically just two stars, and below or maybe to the right of that will be a right angle known as Coma Berenices. To find the remaining three constellations, let's go back to the bright orange star in Bootes, Arcturus that we arc to from the handle of the Big Dipper. And on one side of Arcturus will be the right angle, Coma Berenices. 
and on the opposite side of Arcturus will be a beautiful small semicircle, Corona Borealis. And next to it will be a large H, or maybe you can only make out the square, or uh, uh, what's called the keystone, and that's Hercules. And that leaves just one more constellation of spring, and that's the largest and longest of the 88 constellations, Hydra, the serpent. To find Hydra, let's go back to Regulus, the bright star in Leo the lion, in the backward question mark, or the sickle asterism. And the head of Hydra is halfway between Regulus and Procyon, the bright star in Canis Minor that we covered in the constellations of winter. From the head of Hydra, you should be able to make out the line of stars going down to Hydra's tail, just below the lopsided square of Corvus the crow. Now that we've found all the spring constellations, let's find out about them and what there is to see in each. I'll start with Ursa Major. It's one of the oldest constellations, and as I mentioned, the Big Dipper is just a part of the constellation, and the whole thing is huge, and it's called Ursa Major, the Big Bear. There are numerous legends associated with this constellation. To the Cherokee, the handle of the Big Dipper represents a team of hunters pursuing a bear. To the Iroquois and some other North American Indians, the bear is being hunted by a group of seven warriors. And the hunt begins each spring when the bear leaves his den, Corona Borealis. The Sioux Indians saw the animal as a long-tailed skunk <laughs> instead of a bear, and the Crow Indians saw the Big Dipper as seven stars, Inca Sapua, where seven warriors resided, or seven bison bulls. The Chinese and the ancient Hebrews saw the Big Dipper as a bushel of food. The Romans saw it as a team of seven oxen. And in Greek legend, Zeus and one of his many lovers, or actually he attacked her, Callisto, had a son, Arcus. But Zeus's wife, Hera, was jealous and she turned Callisto into a bear. And one day while out hunting, Arcus nearly killed Callisto, so Zeus rescued them both and put them into the heavens, Arcus as a bear as well. And they chase each other around the North Star. In Ursa Major, there is the famous optical double in the middle of the handle, Mizar and Alcor. And there are many galaxies, most notably M81, a spectacular spiral galaxy, and M82, a galaxy of undetermined shape, both visible in binoculars. Also M101, another galaxy that can be seen with larger binoculars or a small telescope. In a three inch or larger telescope, you can see the planetary nebula, known as the Owl Nebula, M97, Though it will only look like a hazy patch, you won't see the owl unless you have a very large telescope. Uh, the two eyes make it look like an owl. The two pointer stars of the Big Dipper point to Polaris and Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. Uh, this was recognized as a constellation in 600 BC when it was described by the Greek astronomer Athales. And Ursa Minor has the North Star which is close to, but not exactly, the North Celestial Pole, Polaris. It will come within 27 arc seconds of the North Celestial Pole in the year 2100 due to precession, or the wobbling of the Earth on its own axis. And after that, it'll begin to move away from the North Celestial Pole, and another star will become the North Star. Eventually, it'll be Vega, or Vega. Polaris is a double star, and it has an 8th magnitude companion, 18 arc seconds away, visible in a 3-inch or larger telescope. John Keats wrote of Polaris, Bright star, would I as steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor, hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient sleepest Aramite. Also, Julius Caesar says in Shakespeare's eponymous play, I am as constant as the North Star, of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They all are fire, and every one doth shine. But there is but one in all doth hold his place. Then after comparing himself to the North Star, he goes to the Senate and he's stabbed to death. 
the two pointer stars of the Big Dipper point west to the sickle asterism, or backward question mark, and that's Leo the lion. This constellation was recognized as a lion by the ancient Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Syrians, the Greek, and the Romans. The Chinese saw it as a horse, and the Incans as a puma. It's part of the zodiac, and Leo's head makes up the asterism, known as the sickle or backward question mark, and the brightest star is Regulus, Latin for little king. It's magnitude 1.4. The beta star is Denebola, uh, Arabic for lion's tail. And there are numerous galaxies in Leo. M65, M66, NGC 3628 are known as the Leo Trio, visible in binoculars. And there are also the nearby M95 and M96, close spiral galaxies visible in a small telescope. Leo also contains the well-known double star, Gamma Leonis, also known as Algeba. An 80 millimeter telescope at high power will split this pretty pair of yellow-orange stars 4.6 arc seconds apart. The primary star is magnitude 2.3 and the companion is magnitude 3.6. In between Ursa Major and Ursa Minor we find Draco the dragon. The Greeks and the Romans saw it as a dragon, while the Persians saw it as a man eating serpent, and the Egyptians saw it as a crocodile. There are many myths associated with Draco. In one, the dragon attacked Athena while she was fighting the Titans, and she threw the dragon into the sky. Draco contains what used to be the North Star 4,000 years ago, Thuban. And Draco is the radiant for the draconid meteor shower occurring about October 9th. And it contains a number of galaxies and an 8th magnitude planetary nebula NGC 6543, known as the Cat's Eye Nebula. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1786. This planetary nebula will appear bluish-greenish in color, but you need a high-power magnification and a large telescope to make out the hazy disk. Near Draco is the two-story house with a steep roof, and that will be Cepheus the king. This constellation is circumpolar, meaning it rotates closely around the North Celestial Pole. It has no bright stars, and it can be hard to make out, but it's been known for thousands of years. In mythology, Cepheus was the husband of Cassiopeia and the father of Andromeda whom they both chained to a rock in order to save the kingdom of Ethiopia. After uh, Cassiopeia and, and Cepheus bragged about their daughter being so beautiful. The alpha star of Cepheus is Alderamine. And in Cepheus you find Delta Cephei, one of the most famous variable stars. And it's a prototype variable known as Cepheids that made American astronomer Henrietta Swan Leavitt, famous for her discovery of the relationship between period and luminosity in Cepheid variables, which helped determine their distance from Earth. Also in Cepheus is Mu Cephei, a star so red that William Herschel dubbed it the Garnet Star. Mu Cephei is magnitude 4, one of the largest known stars. If it replaced our Sun, it would engulf the orbit of Jupiter. And it's a supernova candidate. Cepheus is rich in star clusters and nebulae, including IC 1396, an open cluster just one and a half degrees south of the Garnet Star. It's large, over a degree and a half in diameter, so you might be able to make out the surrounding nebulosity if viewing from a very dark sky and a very transparent night. Try using an O3 filter in front of your eyepiece. Back to the Big Dipper, the end of the handle points to Bootes. The name derives from Greek for the herdsman, and the constellation is often depicted as a herdsman, leading the dogs of Canis Venatici, chasing the bears of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. The brightest star of Bootes is Arcturus, the fourth uh, brightest star in the sky, magnitude negative 0.5. Arcturus is only 34 light years away, and it's also known as Arcus, the son of Zeus and one of his lovers, Callisto. Arcturus has a large proper motion and has moved about a degree in the past 2,000 years, which is a lot. The other stars of Bootes are not very bright. Some people say that the constellation looks like a kite, 
but the other stars are so dim it's hard to see a kite, to me anyway. It does contain a beautiful triple star, Azar, Epsilon Bootis, visible in binoculars, with a brilliant golden primary star and a snowy white secondary. It also contains NGC 5466, a nice globular cluster 47,000 light years away at magnitude 8.5, visible in a small telescope. Next to the Big Dipper, we find Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs, often portrayed as a pair of greyhounds in pursuit of the bears. The brightest star of this tiny constellation is the beautiful double star, Cor Caroli. The brighter star is magnitude 2.9 and it's blue, while its companion is magnitude 5.5 and it's yellow. It's just gorgeous in binoculars or a small telescope. Also in Canis Venatici is the spectacular globular cluster M3, about 10 arc minutes wide, magnitude 6, and a 6-inch telescope, hundreds of individual stars can be resolved. Canis Venatici is also home to the famous Whirlpool Galaxy M51, 31 million light years away, and the first to be identified as a spiral galaxy. M51 is not far from the end of the handle of the Big Dipper. And at magnitude 8.5, it's visible in binoculars from a dark sky site or a small telescope from a very dark sky. But it'll only appear as a fuzzy patch. With a 6 inch or larger telescope, you should be able to make out the spiral structure. A much easier target in Canis Venatici is the beautiful carbon star Gamma Canum Venaticorum, a beautiful 5th magnitude star named La Superba by Angelo Secchi, a 19th century Italian astronomer, due to its deep red color, well seen in binoculars. The star is near the um, end of its life and it gives off a lot of carbon and is a variable star, changing about one magnitude every 158 days. Near Canis Venatici, we find Coma Berenices, Berenices hair. It used to be the tail of Leo, it was named for the Queen Berenice by her husband, Ptolemy III of Egypt. It lies perpendicular to the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, giving a look beyond our galaxy, and indeed, it contains the Coma Galaxy Cluster of more than a thousand galaxies. The cluster can be seen with the small telescope near the border with Virgo. Two of the galaxies you can see with big binoculars or a small telescope M64, the Black Eye Galaxy, and M85, a ninth magnitude spiral. Coma Berenices also contains Malat 111, also known as the Coma Cluster, an open cluster visible to the naked eye, and excellent in binoculars. Corona Borealis is a small but beautiful constellation which resembles a crown. I've always loved looking at this constellation ever since I first identified it. Something about the elegant crown shape spoke to me. Its brightest star is Alpheca, and it's an eclipsing binary, magnitude 2.2, which dims slightly during eclipses. This constellation has an interesting legend about it. Ar Ariadne, daughter of Minos, the king of Crete, was reluctant to marry a mere mortal, Dionysus, especially after she assisted the deceiving and pusillanimous Theseus, and he abandoned her on a ship while she was sleeping after she had helped him slay the Minotaur. To prove he was a god, Dionysus took off his crown and threw it into the heavens in tribute to Ariadne, and she married him, and she became immortal herself. There are 400 galaxies in this constellation. None is visible in an Earth-based telescope, though. They are about a billion light years away from our galaxy. But in Corona Borealis, we find T. Coronae Borealis, a remarkable star known as the Blaze Star. It's a recurrent nova bursting suddenly to magnitude 2 in 1866 and again in 1946, it will surely do so again. At its darkest, it's magnitude 10, just at the limit of a typical binoculars, but worth taking a look at to see if it bursts to magnitude 2 while observing and nabbing your first nova. In between the head of Draco and Corona Borealis, we find Hercules, the strong man, one of the earliest constellations connected with an earlier hero, Gilgamesh. 
He's kneeling with his foot on the head of Draco. The brightest star of Hercules is Rasselgethi, Arabic for kneeler's head. <laughs> and it's a beautiful double star, one red and one green. Inside Hercules is the famous and most spectacular globular cluster in the sky, M13, the Hercules Cluster, also sometimes known as the Keystone Cluster. It contains over 300,000 stars. It's 23,000 light years away and it's magnitude 6, visible to the naked eye from a dark sky site and easily visible in binoculars. It's beautiful in a small telescope. Hercules has another globular cluster nearly as bright, M92, that's often overlooked because M13 is so spectacular. Low on the horizon, we find a trapezoid, Corvus, the crow. Legend has it that Corvus, the crow or raven, was sent to fetch a cup of water for Apollo, and when he dawdled while waiting for a fig to ripen, which is ridiculous, uh, then he lied to Apollo, saying that a serpent had attacked him, and he was banished to the sky by Apollo, where he sits within view of the cup, crater, but he can't drink from it. The four main stars of Corvus form a distinct trapezium found below Virgo, southwest of Spica, or sometimes pronounced Spica. It has several galaxies and a planetary nebula, NGC 4361, which is part of the Astronomical Society's Herschel 400, an observing program. Corvus also contains the ring-tailed galaxy, NGC 4038 and 4039, a pair of galaxies colliding with each other. They are faint at magnitude 11 and require an 8-inch or larger telescope, but they are the brightest pair of interacting galaxies. To the west of Corvus is the long constellation Hydra, the sea serpent or many-headed monster slain by Hercules. It's the longest and largest constellation in the night sky. It takes four hours for Hydra to rise. The brightest star in Hydra is Alphard, Arabic for a solitary one, and it's magnitude two. It contains the beautiful planetary nebula NGC 3242, the ghost of Jupiter, and M48, a bright open cluster, M68, a globular cluster, and M83, a spiral galaxy, difficult to see for northern observers because it's so low. And just above Corvus is Virgo, also known as the Maiden. It's the only female in the zodiac. It's one of the oldest constellations and has assumed the identity of numerous deities worldwide including Ishtar, Isis, Demeter, Athena, and Artemis. Virgo is huge. It's the second largest in the sky after Hydra. The sun spends more time in Virgo than any other constellation of the zodiac. The only bright star is Spica or Spica. Um, according to space.com, it's Spica, and it is Latin, and since no one speaks Latin, <laughs> I guess you can say either one. Um, it's Latin for ear of wheat, which is held in the maiden's hand. It's magnitude one, but it contains a double star, Porima, or Gamma Virginis, both magnitude three. It will appear as a single star in binoculars, but can be split with a moderate-sized telescope. Also, the brightest Quasar that you can see is in Virgo is 3C273 Virginis, magnitude 13. It requires an 8-inch or larger telescope. More interesting in Virgo is the Virgo cluster of about 3,000 galaxies, of which our own galaxy is a member. The brightest one is M104, the Sombrero Galaxy. It's visible in binoculars at magnitude 8, and it shows a dark lane in telescopes. Also, you'll find M87, an elliptical galaxy. Others you might be able to see with binoculars are M84, M86, M88, M89, M90, and M92. Uh, to see them well requires large binoculars or small telescope. And that's it for the constellations of spring. 
I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back soon with the constellations of summer. Until then, get outside and enjoy the night sky and find some constellations. Dark skies forever. Sula, signing off. <laughs>